make a roof for the ark, and finish it to a cubit above. Put the door of the ark in its sides. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kind, and of the animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten and store it up, and, then, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. In all the world, there was one righteous man. This was long ago, in a time where violence and corruption were in abundance, and righteousness was in a shortage. And so God decides, in order to address this problem, he's going to wipe everything out. Hit the reset button, so to speak, and start over with this one righteous man, a guy named Noah. Well, Noah and his family, and two of every creature on the earth. So the rains start to come, and the waters start to rise, and Noah's ark starts to float. And the rains pour for 40 days, and they cover the whole earth. And outside the ark, there is no sound but splashing. And inside the ark, there is no silence, because it's a zoo. <laughs> Eventually, the rain stops. But it's rained so hard for so long, it takes another 150 days for the waters to diminish enough that the peaks of the mountains start to show at the top. And then comes another sign of hope, a dove that flies back with an olive branch in its beak, a sign of life. But the best sign of hope comes at the end, when the waters have receded completely, and God paints a rainbow in the sky as a sign of God's covenant. Never again. Never again will the solution to sin be complete annihilation. We're not going to do this again. So Noah and his family begin to repopulate the earth. But it seems as though the plan has failed, because out of this one righteous man, there's not just righteousness that breeds. The Old Testament holds nothing back in describing the corruption and violence that takes place. Anger and jealousy, lust and idolatry, wars, everything, you name it, it's in there. So it seems kind of like a failed experiment. One righteous man was not the solution. And so what's to be done about this problem of sin that runs rampant on the earth? God has already ruled out flood as an option. But maybe there's something to that one righteous man. Maybe there's a key in that. And so God sends one righteous man again. One perfectly righteous man. But this time, the plan is like the inverse of the first one. The first time, God destroyed the whole world to save one man. This time, God will allow one man to be destroyed in order to save the whole world. I bet many of you know John 3.16 by heart. It describes this well for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever and believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.17 is less known but equally important here. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be
mankind was saved through him. One righteous man to save the world. But we living today might wonder if it worked. Because there seems to still be an abundance of violence and corruption. Maybe if you watched the news this morning, you've got some of it fresh on your mind. It happens every day, all the time. It rains. It rains. If Jesus Christ was sent to be the one man to save the world, then what happened? And we can't tell. We don't get the benefit of looking at two timelines, seeing the difference between a world where Jesus lived and died for us and a world where Jesus didn't. And maybe this would be easier if we could compare one with the other. But I think, even without comparing, I believe that the world is different because Jesus lived and died for us. That Jesus did save the world through what happened on the cross. When Paul writes his letter to the Romans, he digs into this as he tries to explain to them the dynamic of sin as it relates to those of us who have faith in Christ. He tells them that sin came into the world through the first man, Adam. And sin has been defeated through one man as well, Jesus Christ. So in Romans chapter 5, he explains it to them like this. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Then as one man's trespass, that's Adam, led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness, that's Jesus, leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. By one man, many will be made righteous. Through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, our sins hung there too and died with him. Through Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness anytime, whenever we need it. In essence, it's like our own personal reset button. Through Jesus Christ, we have an example of how to live for God and love other people. Through Jesus Christ, we have the chance to be righteous in a way we could never on our own. And I believe that through Jesus Christ, we no longer live in a world where there is one righteous man, but where there are millions of righteous people. And I believe it because I've seen it. And it shows up in ways that aren't newsworthy. You won't see them on the morning news, but they're important. Yesterday we celebrated the life of Jean Christie, and in that world, I see God's righteousness. I see a life lived for love that had an effect on countless people. And I've seen it in you, too, in this congregation. A group of people that loves each other, that welcomes every person who walks through the doors, that forgives each other, that's faithfully following God, I see righteousness in you. And most of all, I see it in those small acts that go completely unrecognized. In the one who takes out the trash without recognition or thanks. In the one who takes the time to call her elderly friends just to check on them and make sure they're okay. In the one who wakes up early in the morning and reads his Bible and drops to his knees before he goes to bed at night. There is righteousness in the world. Now, none of these people are perfect. <coughs> Not even Jean Christie. But because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be perfect. Because of Jesus Christ, we do our best. We live our lives 
into righteousness as best we can. And whenever we mess up, whenever we fall short, whenever we contribute to that violence and corruption it's talking about in the scripture for today, then we know we take advantage of the reset button that God has given us. We tap into the forgiveness that was secured for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. And we do our best again to live into the righteousness that God has called us to. We can never be righteous on our own. But through Jesus Christ, this is the gift and the grace that God has given us. That all of us have the capability to be righteous through him. Now on a rainy week like this, we have a lot of rainbow sighting opportunities, I think. Eventually, the sun will come out again. And the next time you see a rainbow, I want you to remember God's promise. A promise that, at that moment, was to never flood the world again. A promise that the solution to sin would not be annihilation. But a promise that came to completion in Jesus Christ. A promise that eventually gave all of us a reset button through forgiveness and the ability to be made righteous and to embody righteousness in the world today. Amen. Amen. Would you open your hymnals to page 12?